Jonah is running away from God. Chapter 1 of the most amazing book, surely in the Old Testament, unless it's the book of Genesis itself, is the story of God's patient, loving, and yet drastic confrontation with one of his most dedicated prophets who loved God's holiness, righteousness, and reputation as the God of all the nations of the world. Now the New Testament, friends, makes a great point of this. Don't turn but listen to this statement in Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And that's one of the main themes of the book of Jonah. He's not some local tribal deity who is concerned only with this little nation down here. Now, sad to say, dear friends, many Jews actually viewed their God that way. They were so afraid, you see, of the God, the gods of Assyria, the gods of Egypt, that on time, in times of apostasy, they actually worshiped those gods. And even the lesser gods of a small group of Canaanites, the Baal, Asherah gods, they had more respect for them than they did for their own God. And that is true, of course, of many who claim to be Christians in America today. The Lord Jesus warned us about, uh, you cannot love God and mammon. You say, who in the world is mammon? That's his special word for material things of the world. The world's pleasures, the world's priorities, the world's perspectives. You can't worship the world system and all that it offers and God also. You can't worship God on Sunday and the world the rest of the week. He's watching. And someday we'll give an account to him, will, will we not, for what our loyalty level has been to the God who paid an infinite price to redeem us to himself, the price of the blood of his own son on the cross. And we are no longer our own, but we have been purchased by him and we're his property for, by virtue of creation and redemption. We belong to him. We're his bondservants. Total 100% loyalty is what he demands of his servants. And Jonah, of course, is no exception. Now, friends, as we turn to Jonah chapter 1, we look together at verse number 4. Are you ready? Jonah is now moving across the Mediterranean Sea with increasing complacency and pride at his clever scheme of escaping from the immediate pressure of being a prophet in the Holy Land of Israel. But, don't you like that word? Men make their own plans and schemes, but God is in control. Friends, the living God, the one true living God of heaven and earth, has the first and last words in this amazing book, and he, not Jonah, is the principal person of this book, and he was and always will be totally sovereign in the whole world. And friends, God wants us to know that. Why, right from the beginning when he called Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you a blessing to, through you, through your seed, <coughs> I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. No nation on this planet that's ever existed can please God since he revealed himself to Abraham apart from the relationship to the Jews. And the Lord Jesus was and is a Jew, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Did you know that? Humanly speaking, he's a 100% Jew. And you can't come to God apart from the Jews. The New Testament makes that crystal clear. There's only one way, and that's God's way through the chosen people of whom the Lord Jesus was the final 
ultimate fulfillment, and he is the dynamic of Israel. And yet, friends, today the whole world hates the Jew. Why? Because Satan, the god of this world, is determined, determined to destroy every purpose, every plan that God has ever had. At least we can't say we weren't warned. He said to Satan at the beginning of human history, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. There's going to be eternal conflict between you, Satan, and the seed of the woman who turns out to be the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who crushed Satan on the cross of Calvary, in the process Satan killed him. That's the conflict of the ages. And God hates the Jews because of it. Did I say God? Satan, the God of this world, hates the Jews because they are God's chosen people. Satan, I'm sure, was delighted to see this prophet heading west. The last thing Satan wanted, of course, dear friends, was for the Ninevites to repent. He doesn't want anybody to repent. He wants them all to join him in the lake of fire forever. He hates people. Why? Because they have the image and likeness of the God he hates. So whenever a prophet, a servant of God, disobeys the Lord, count on this one. Satan and all demons are rejoicing. Just like when one person is converted, Jesus said, what happens? All the angels of heaven rejoice. There's an angelic tension and conflict going on constantly as to what you do and I do in reference to God. They're watching, they're fascinated, they're involved, they're concerned about what you and I do when God speaks his word. Jonah heads west, Satan is delighted, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. When it says the Lord sent, that means, friends, he unleashed, he cast forth. It's a violent term. And the storm was absolutely stupendous. You know, the Bible tells us a lot of things about storms. We live down in Florida where we have been officially warned that even now, between now and early August and in to the month of November, there could be 10 gigantic hurricanes. In fact, they've named them all in advance. And uh, everybody has been meticulously warned, told exactly, precisely what to do in case the hurricane comes, of uh, where to flee, what to take with you, and all of these things. Uh, it, it, wouldn't you think that everybody in Florida would be in total terror about God and constantly talking to him and trusting him and doing whatever's necessary to be on good terms with him. He's the God of storms. Now count your many blessings. I've never heard of any storms up here. <laughs> but uh, listen to what God says about storms in the ocean. Listen to this. Don't turn, just listen. Psalm 107. Verse 23, they that go down to the sea in ships like Jonah did, that do business in great waters like the sailors did on that ship that he was in, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof and they mount up to the heaven and they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let me tell you about another storm. It happened in a little tiny sea. You can hardly see it's a little dot at the top of this J for Joppa. It's called the Sea of what? Galilee. You know what happened there one night? Thirteen men were in a boat. 
Jesus and 12 other human beings and a stupendous storm came that God brought into that sea which frequently happened. It was a very dangerous sea because of those storms. Well, 12 of the 13 men were in total terror and Jesus was perfectly at peace with his Father in heaven, sound asleep, exhausted, having a human nature, you see, as well as a divine nature. Well, the 12 men knew what those storms could do and they were totally convinced that within minutes they would all be at the bottom of the sea, all 13. Conveniently forgetting that when they got into the boat, Jesus said, we're going to the other side, not the bottom. But in terror and panic, we often forget the promises of the Lord, don't we? So they frantically began bailing out the boat, and all of a sudden, for some strange reason I've never understood, they stopped, went back to the back of the boat to arouse the sleeping Jesus, and rebuked him. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Here you're sleeping. Within minutes, we're all dead. What happened? Jesus stood up, looked at those 12 terrified faces, and said, O oh, ye of little faith. He turned to the raging storm and said, Peace, be still. And instantly there was a calm. The men were in total terror. If they were afraid of the storm, they were really terrified now. <laughs> they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and waves obey him? Because they knew from the Old Testament that only God can do things like that. He's the God of the oceans, the storms, the winds of the elements of the world. They knew that they were in the presence of God incarnate. Oh, friends, God puts people into desperate situations not just storms at sea, and I've been in one. I, I frankly didn't think I'd survive coming back across the Atlantic Ocean in a troop ship in January 1946 from Europe. I mean, there were no stabilizers in that thing, and a tremendous storm just tossed us like this. I mean, there were 3,000 soldiers in that thing. And most of us decided, look, we'd rather die than go any further. But God mercifully brought us to the shores as we saw the Statue of Liberty. I have a picture of that as we approached the New York Harbor. And at last we landed, but sad to say, friends, very few of those men praised the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works. Very few. He's the God who brings you to desperation, to sickness, cancer, threats, to do what? If to do anything necessary to destroy our false complacency where we think we've got everything under control. And God says, oh, no, you don't. Watch this. And we say, well, why, Lord, did you do that to me? Can't you just hear him say, to get your attention? Thank you. You ever been in a situation where you had no place to turn but to him? That's the best situation to be in. And someday God will show us that, won't he? The times in our life when we were at the verge of despair were the times when he did his deepest work in our heart and mind and soul. Well, friends, you can imagine how these sailors were feeling about now, especially when they found Jonah sound asleep. I mean, everybody was in terror except Jonah. You know what this uh, book of Jonah tells us about people? Think of this. In this book, idolatrous sailors on the Mediterranean Sea and cruel Ninevites over in Assyria represent all the Gentiles of their world in their deep spiritual darkness, yet totally capable of repentance. Jonah, however, represents self-centered, complacent, proud, arrogant Israel pursuing her own agenda in deliberate disobedience to the clearly revealed will of God. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought the Bible said that the saints are always God's favorites. No, we are his greatest burden. <laughs> We're the biggest problem God has. <laughs> he agonizes over us. We grieve the Holy Spirit. We quench the Holy Spirit. 
constantly. He's really not that worried about the unsaved world. He's worried about us. You know why? We represent him. We're the only people on earth that tell the unbeliever what God is like. Do they know what God is really like by what they see in you and me? The way we react to situations, the way we handle our daily affairs, the way we... Friends, no wonder God is very, very sad about his church and about his people Israel. Jonah, why aren't you terrified? What are you doing sleeping there? Friends, it's all right to sleep when you uh, deserve it. God gives to his beloved rest. Yes. But there are times when we should be doing his will when we're sleeping on the job. Gethsemane, the crisis that the Lord Jesus came into the world to accomplish, sweating, as it were, drops of blood, agonizing over the cup of infinite agony he was about to receive from his father upon the cross. And he said to the inner group of the three most dedicated apostles, Peter, James, and please just <clears throat> wait with me, watch with me for one hour. And he prayed to his father, oh, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he came back, and the three men were fervently, effectually praying. No sound asleep. Friends, at the most crucial times when God expects us to be where the action is in the center of his will, where are we? At the bottom of the ship, sound asleep. Well, friends, be assured of this. Another great servant of God, a courageous servant of God, was also floating one day in a ship across the Mediterranean Sea, and his name was the Apostle Paul. And there was another tremendous storm. I mean, the Mediterranean is notorious for storms, especially in the winter months. We can guarantee you this. Paul was the most alert, God-conscious sensitive person on the ship. In fact, the captain had tremendous respect for Paul and his, and his opinions about what, even though he was a prisoner. Paul was available. Paul was accessible to God. Are you, am I, in times of crisis that God accomplishes in our lives and our members of our family, our loved ones and friends and neighbors, are we the ones that God can use? Well, then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. And they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. You see, one man sins and all kinds of people are affected. Are we really aware of that? What happens when you put one rotten apple into a barrel of nice apples? You say, well, the nice apples make the rotten one better. No. <laughs> the rotten one makes all the good ones bad. That's an amazing law. That was a law of Israel. Any unclean thing that touches a clean thing does not become cleaner. It makes the clean things unclean. And one rotten, disobedient man in this ship wrecks everybody who's in the ship. I know the reverse is also true by the mercy of God. That one righteous person representing God can be the means by which many are saved. That was true of Paul's trip, wasn't it, in that ship 700 years later. I've often prayed, Lord... <laughs> I'm utterly unworthy to be your servant, but on this airplane, on this flight from Jacksonville to Detroit to Minneapolis to Duluth, a thousand things can happen to wreck the whole ship, this airship. Please, Lord, I don't know, if you want me to be in Duluth, then perhaps you're going to save everybody in this ship just for my sake to get me there. Did you ever pray like that? Lord, somehow, protect this vehicle, this bus, ship, train, whatever it is, for the sake of the ministry, the testimony you've committed to me, for you. It's amazing how those things work. 
God uses a remnant, a minority, to be the means to save many. On the other hand, he can use one disobedient servant to wreck the lives of many. And these mariners, these sailors, are absolutely on the verge of despair. In fact, they're so desperate that everyone cries to his own God. Look, these sailors represent different nations, different religions. They come from all over the world. And those ships of Tarshish, by the way, they went across the Mediterranean, were famous, well-built ships. We're beginning to discover a few of them that sank, you know, off the coast of Turkey and other places. Amazingly designed, constructed ships. And some people think that back in those days, even, if, even back to 900, 1000 BC, those ships could actually go all the way out into the Atlantic Ocean, all the way down around Africa to India, and bring back things to Solomon's court that only could have come from India by way of those ships. Peacocks, apes, etc., etc. Amazing. Amazing. And those mariners were experts. They spent their lives doing these kinds of things. And Ezekiel chapter 28 describes how magnificently furnished and supplied and equipped and designed the ships of Tarshish really were. They came, you see, from Tyre and Sidon, where the mariners were world-renowned. But in this situation, they're saying, look, throw out the goods into the ocean. We're in total desperation. Oh, God, and they named whatever God they had ever heard about. Get us out of this mess. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said to him, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise and call upon thy God? If so be that God would think upon us that we may not perish. O oh, friends, how embarrassing to God. Can you imagine a pagan shipmaster saying to God's servant from Israel, the chosen people, Why are you sleeping? Why aren't you doing something spiritual and religious to get us out of this mess? And so today, people who don't know the Lord are perhaps wondering, why don't Christians act more like Christians? You think anybody ever thought that about you? I know I'm sure they've thought that about me. The world has higher expectations of Christians in terms of what? Honesty and consistency and faithfulness to their God than perhaps we do. We'd be amazed sometime to discover how much the unbeliever knows about us and is thinking about us because we are perhaps the only Bible they'll ever read or hear. What are you doing sleeping down here? Well, friends, that's sad to say a picture of the whole nation of Israel for centuries. Why are you people sleeping when you should be serving your God? You know, friends, one of the most tragic experiences that I've had in recent years took place early in this summer in the month of June. Let me try to tell you what happened. I was giving lectures uh, in Washington, D.C. and um, took the opportunity while there to visit the Holocaust Museum. Who's been to that? three or four people. Awesome. It is magnificently designed. It is a gigantic operation with six or seven stories. You start at the top and work your way down and see all these pictures, hear these tapes, watch these displays of the systematic plan and plot of Hitler and the Gestapo to destroy every Jew in the world. And they succeeded to kill Six million Jews. Do you know why they have to have a museum? Because there are Americans that think the whole thing never happened. They can't believe that anybody could be that wicked. I'm sorry, friends. The Bible puts it straight. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? And God says, you have no idea how deep human depravity can sink with the help of Satan, the God of this world. 
Now, wouldn't you think that the Israelites, the Jews who, is, who f that did survive the Holocaust of the concentration camps in Germany would come out of there saying, oh God, thank you for your mercy, thank you for teaching us that we were going astray from you. We really weren't serving you faithfully. <clears throat> uh, we really should believe in your Messiah. See? I mean, Deuteronomy 28 says intricately, verse by verse, this, if you depart from me, here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to destroy you systematically. And it gives all the details in advance. Leviticus 26 says the same thing. God said, you are my chosen people, and because you've disobeyed me deliberately, defiantly, I'm going to make you pay double for your sins. Wouldn't you think that all Jews in the world would say, that's it. We've disobeyed the Lord. We got the message. <clears throat> we will now honor and worship Him. You know what Isaiah said? Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? God gave them to the Nazis to destroy. See? Did not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither would they be obedient to his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it hath set him on fire round about. That's what happened in the concentration camps. Millions of Jews died in the fires of the furnaces of the crematoriums. Yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. Century after century, the Jews have experienced pogroms and holocausts and persecutions and horrors. 1,900 years of this. And Isaiah says, there's a very deep mystery here. The chosen people refuse to listen to the Lord. Jonah, what are you sleeping for? You have a message that only God could have given. You have a message that these sailors des desperately need to hear. They're worshiping pagan false gods that can't do anything. They can't answer prayer. They can't hear prayer. Guess why? They're not there. That's a real disadvantage, by the way, of being a god if you don't even exist. You really can't do very much. And the only one who knew the true God is sound asleep doing nothing. By the way, we're not blaming Israel and puffing up ourselves. The church has failed also. Someday God will show us that, won't he? O oh, you sleeper, arise and call upon thy God, if so be that your God will think upon us and that we perish not. And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. By the way, do you know how lots worked in the Old Testament? It was a unique scheme God entrusted especially to Israel that he blessed and honored and used. Long before, of course, there was a complete Bible like you and I have. We don't need to use lots anymore. You know why? We have the complete scripture. The last time any lots were ever cast in the will of God was when Peter and the apostles cast the lots to discern which new apostle would replace Judas Iscariot, Acts 1, and the next chapter the church is born, Acts 2, and there's never been casting of lots from that day to this. That's not his plan for the church, his bride, the body. But in ancient Israel, he entrusted the Urim and Thummim, you know, to the high priest to determine the will of God in certain situations. And that, remember, was how Achan was discovered to be the one who betrayed his trust in God. Remember that? That's how Jonathan was discovered by Saul, the king. And many times, dear friends, through the centuries, God used that method. In fact, he said in Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. He's in charge of that whole method. Now, where these pagan mariners picked up this idea, I have no concept at all. 
but it worked. <laughs> Why? Because God's prophet was the target. So the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? Of what people art thou? Five urgent questions. You're the man who's responsible for this horror. What in the world are you doing here? Well, Jonah was too embarrassed to tell them the correct answers to some of these questions, like, what is thine occupation? He could have said, well, I am a special, chosen, reputable prophet of the Lord. <laughs> I'm sure that there are times when you would hesitate to say to somebody that you just offended, I'm a 100% bona fide member of this wonderful church here in Duluth. Now, the less said, the better. Oh, friends, look what he said. I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. Now, listen to this one. The God of heaven, which hath made the sea. I worship a God who's not some finite, wicked projection of depraved hearts who can't do anything any more than the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, you see, a hundred years earlier, could conjure up from Baal any response, even a lightning bolt. No. Elijah mocked them. He said, you're God? He must be on a journey. Maybe he fell asleep. Maybe you have to shout louder. Wake him up. No. I fear and worship a God who is so great that he actually created the ocean and he created the dry land and he created the whole world and the whole universe. I wonder where he got that idea. Try Exodus 20:11. In six days the Lord thy God created heaven, earth, and sea and all that in them is. Oh, he must be very great. He must be able to answer prayer. He must be able to do something about storms. And then the men were exceedingly afraid. And they said to him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Get the point? How can you, a worshiper, as you yourself have said, of a God that great, have the audacity to disobey him? If we were in your shoes, sir, we would be 100% dedicated to knowing him, honoring him, obeying him, and making his glory known all over the world. This whole ship would be filled with missionaries carrying the good news to the whole planet Earth. What are you doing sleeping here? Running away from him. Wrecking our ship and our, endangering our lives. I, I want a tape recording someday of this whole thing. How, how about a videotape? Think the Lord will show us some videotapes someday if we ask him? I want to see animals walking into Noah's Ark, too. And then they said to him, What shall we do to thee, that the sea may become to us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. In other words, literally, it was growing more and more tempestuous. The waves are getting bigger and bigger. And they got the message plain and clear through their years of experience in that sea that this was something unique. This was special. The God of Jonah was angry. And he said to them, Well, since you asked, I have a suggestion. Just take me up and cast me forth into the sea, and so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. You see, friends, God had told him that. Jonah, I'm going to wreck everybody's life into, with whom you have contact or connection. I'm going to wreck everything that you touch, including this very ship. Because Jonah, I'm angry with you. 
Well, the men had some kind of a sense of awe at this representative of a god that could bring a storm like this, and they just didn't want to take any chances by killing deliberately, intentionally, God's prophet. So what did they do? They rowed hard to bring the ship to land, but they couldn't. For the sea wrought, it was getting more and more tempestuous, and therefore they cried unto the Lord and said, <clears throat> We beseech thee, O Lord. Now, which God are they talking to now? Guess what? They've all been converted. <laughs> They're all, they, they all now understand who is the God of the universe. They're praying to him. Aren't you impressed with Jonah as a great evangelist and soul winner? <laughs> you know, many people that we think we won to the Lord, I, I don't even like to use that term anymore myself, uh, came to the Lord in spite of us, not because of us. It happened to me in Atlanta in the airport uh, in, I think it was March. I was flying back to Jacksonville, stopping over for an hour in Atlanta to change planes, and I was sitting there reading a Christian book. And uh, a man and his wife leaned over and said, that looks like an interesting book you're reading there. Uh, oh, what's it about? Where can we get one? And uh, so I told them a little bit, and, and uh, we, I found that they, were, they lived in Orange Park just like uh, we do. I mean, a little southern suburb of Jacksonville. And I said, well, that's amazing. And I gave them a gospel tract with our name and phone number on it. And uh, thought, well, that's the end of that. When I got back to Orange Park, two or three days later, they phoned and said, well, um, uh, can we come and see you and study the Bible? And I said, well, yes. I mean, I was shocked. Uh, <laughs> you understand at the airport, I was going around praying and giving out tracts, right? <laughs> And uh, I mean, that's the way it is. If we sometimes, someday look back with God's perspective and see that God is the one who brought the people to us, we really weren't vigorously reaching out. Jonah was not a very impressive missionary, friends. <laughs> but the sailors were saying, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish, for this man's life lay not upon us innocent blood. We are desperately concerned from what little we know about Jonah's God that uh, he doesn't like sin, such as murdering in cold blood a person who's innocent. Oh, really? Now, these are pagans, sailors. What's happening in America? Millions of Americans are being murdered by their own mothers before they're born. God is infinitely displeased. Innocent blood! Millions of babies. Partial birth abortions. I can't believe it. I never believed I could live long enough in this country to see this happen and be officially endorsed. Lord, do not lay upon us innocent blood. I mean, pagans have more conscience than a so-called Christian nation that's received massive input and blessing for 200 and some years from God. Where are we? For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. They believed that God was sovereign, that God was omnipotent, that God was holy and righteous. I mean, what more do you want from a group of pagans just converted an hour ago? So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Oh, really? You mean there is some connection then between this God of the oceans and of the world and this particular man? Yes. Listen to Psalm 89, verse 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea, and when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. And he did it in such a way, dear friends, that instantly the whole ocean was an absolute glassy calm. And they were more terrified at the calm than they were at the storm. Just like 700 years later in the Sea of Galilee. 
And the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. They somehow had a sensitivity to what do you do with a God who's real, who can really do something, who's really alive, who has power. You, you have to somehow get a sacrifice to, that he'll accept, right? You, you make promises to him, right? That they intuitively understood some things. That's amazing. Don't underestimate what God can do through the conscience even of an unbeliever. He just knows automatically, intuitively, certain things to be true that you may and I may be amazed at. And so, friends, picture the scene, will you? On a calm sea, as the ship slowly moves, the sailors are all thinking, Jonah is dead! But guess what? Under the surface of the ocean, far from their sight and knowledge, God had prepared a gigantic organic submarine. <laughs> that happened to be just there at the right time, at the right place, with the mouth open just wide enough to fit Jonah. And down he went. The Lord had prepared a great fish. Interesting, the Hebrew word is minna. Now that's so close to minnow that you think it's something tweensy. <laughs> it's not a whale, by the way. It's a special word to describe a special gigantic fish that God apparently just created for that purpose. This is an amazing thing. It says God prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And so as the whale took Jonah back east to vomit him out on the land, and I'm sure that this whale was, so, or this fish was just so glad to disgorge this indigestible passenger. <laughs> And finally, perhaps the ship worked its way back to Joppa from whence it had come to give a report that they had lost everything except their lives. How amazed they must have been later to discover that the one who had died in the ocean was alive. I want to ask the Lord about that. Those sailors never forgot Jonah. Will we? Let's pray. Now, Father, a book that is just vibrating with magnificence in its reflection of your glory, wisdom, power, and our sinfulness and disobedience, and the amazing conscience you've given to men, whereby they can accuse themselves or excuse themselves on the basis of what you have designed in every human being who has your image and likeness, namely a conscience for good and evil that only needs to be enlightened, illumined, informed, instructed in truth. And yet, Lord, instead of doing what I would have done if I were you, to totally destroy this disobedient prophet, you continued working with him in marvelous ways to do your will, and so you continue with us today. He who has begun a good work in you will continue doing that work until the day of Jesus Christ when we meet the Lord Jesus face to face and we're like him when we see him as he is and then we'll confront him at the great judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, and give an account to him, dear Lord, of everything you've ever entrusted to us, ever told us to do. And we know this precious book is the measuring stick to determine our eternal rewards in heaven or loss of them. Help us to master this message that somehow through these studies of the book of Jonah you might protect us from doing ridiculous, foolish, and wicked things that even saints are capable of in the presence of a holy and merciful God. Because we pray in Jesus' great and glorious name and for his sake Amen.